So I just want to thank everyone who's joining us. Uh, people are slowly coming online. Um, this is an Indigenous Climate Action webinar on violence against the land is violence against women. And we're joined today with Kanahus Manuel and Melina Labukon Massimo. And today we're going to be discussing <clears throat> how gender justice and climate justice need to be a part of the same conversation and how violence against the land is also violence against the women. We have our speakers today are both from communities that are challenging the industrial expansion of Alberta's tar sands. And really the big message we wanna get across is there's no consent Trudeau, no man camps, camps on stolen native land. Right now, climate change has caused us to take a look at ourselves and reevaluate our relationship with each other, our communities and the land. Indigenous communities continue to be at the forefront of not just experiencing climate change, but at the heart of the fight against the causes and drivers of climate change. When we talk about climate justice, though, we also have to recognize that women are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and Indigenous women are more likely to experience sexual and physical violence in their lifetimes. In fact, one in four Indigenous women will experience violence in their life and we're more likely to experience violence, about four times more likely to. So this webinar today, we're gonna to explore how violence against the land through the extraction and exploitation of resources, namely fossil fuels, and in this case, tar sands, perpetuates this violence against women. Right now, resources are being taken from our lands and territories, and these, la these resource extraction projects are contaminating the environment, damaging our ecosystems and our traditional landscapes, all while increasing greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, which are worsening and exacerbating climate change. However, it's not just the direct environmental impacts, but these projects also come along with man camps, which are temporary labor force camps that are largely predominated, predominantly um, men. And these camps also come with increased sex trafficking increased drug um, abuse and rates in the communities, increased crime rates, and ultimately violence against women. Today, we're really lucky to have Kanahus Manuel and Melina Labukan Massimo come to discuss how climate justice must also address gender justice, and that we're not gonna find solutions to climate change unless we can address the legacy of violence against indigenous women and climate change together. So again, I just wanna thank you all for coming. And I wanted to give a little bit of a primer on how the three of us are actually a little bit connected. Not a little bit, we're actually very, very connected, but we're connected not necessarily by the most great thing, but the one thing that really connects us is that we're all women. But the thing that's really brought our struggles together is that we're all a part of a massive endeavor to challenge one of the largest industrial projects on planet Earth. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a screen share and show you just so you get an understanding. That's not the right one. <laughs> um, hold on one second. I'm gonna screen share. And I'm gonna show you um, some slides. So, we, we all live in Canada. Um, this is where we're from. And the one thing I love to point out when I show this map of the country is that, yes, there are number treaties. Our number treaties from 1 to 11. We have some pre-Confederation treaties. We have post-Confederation treaties. But you'll notice that on this map of Canada, um, the yellow bits are what are considered unceded or untreated territory, meaning that these territories, there are no agreements for sharing the land. So technically, these belong directly in the hands of First Nations communities. And Kanahus' community comes from the lower um, inland British Columbia, um, and that area is considered untreated. And we often think that, oh, Canada is this country that's been treated, but a large amount of the country hasn't been treated. But today I wanna to talk about the extraction project that's sort of in the heart of Treaty 8, where Melina and myself come from, and it's the tar sands. I do want to talk about, though, that this other thing, and this this is a statistic that I learned from Art Manuel Kanahus' dad, that while the country is treated and we were supposed to have these agreements to share the land, only 0.2% of Canada is considered First Nations land, and the other 99.8% is Crown land, meaning that the government has basically said that they own the whole country minus 0.2%. So we've not, we're not actually sharing the land, we're not equal partners, and the projects that we're challenging the Alberta tar sands are a really great example of that. 
A lot of the reason why Canada doesn't want to give First Nations the rights to this is because our communities sit atop of rich resources that they have been trying to access since the time of colonization. Right now, though, the biggest thing is that Trudeau has has gone on public record, even though he's talked about being a climate champion, even though he's talked about respecting Indigenous rights, he's saying no country would find 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave them there. We have um, First Nations that are protesting the Trans Mountain Pipeline, and, and we have the Liberals saying it doesn't matter. It's a done deal. It's been approved. We even have Supreme Courts that are now siding with the colonial government saying that we can't veto pipelines, but that's not stopping our communities. I come from a community downstream from the, from the Alberta tar sands. I wanted to talk about how we have today Melina Labukon Massimo and Kanahus Manuel with us, and we're going to be talking about gender justice and climate justice together and violence against the land and violence against women. I do want to also recognize that um, there is only three of us. There's not a lot. We're not representative of all women. In fact, we don't have representatives from the LGBTQTI communities or the trans women communities. And we really want to recognize that this is just the first in a series of conversations around gender justice and climate justice as Indigenous women. Um, I did want to share a, just a little bit. There was just one more slide I actually wanted to share with you all on the tar sands, which was a map. Um, so I'm going to try this one more time, but I'm not going to do it with my uh, PowerPoint. I'm just going to do it with a direct screen share. Um, but I wanted to share with you all this map, which ties our struggles together. And I have to open it up. And um, the, the map really shows how all of our communities are connected. Um, and I'm, this, I'm sorry, everybody. This didn't work out the way I wanted it to. This is the map I wanted to show everybody. So this map shows how our struggles are connected. The tar sands are in the heart of Alberta, but the reality is, is that we are all connected. The reason why this is the largest industrial project on planet Earth is that there are pipelines that are being proposed from, to the East Coast, to the West Coast, uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico, and we now even have some proposals of pipelines going up to the Arctic. We have massive train lines, we have energy infrastructure that are all being created to support the Alberta tar sands. And it's time for us to talk about not just our connections to the struggle through fighting the resistance of pipelines and refineries and energy infrastructure, but what it actually means to women who are the first and foremost to experience uh, not just violence against the land, but we're also the first to experience um, the effects of climate change, the effects of contamination to our communities, and the role of women in really addressing the climate crisis right now. Um, and I really want to invite and start today's conversation, not just by giving you these maps and showing you where our fights join us and struggle, but I really want to allow some of the people that have been on the front lines of these struggles challenging the expansion in the heart of tar sands and challenging the expansion through pipeline corridors. So I'd like to start today by welcoming Melina Labukan Massimo, who is a member of the Lubicon Cree Nation in Alberta. Uh, she has worked on social, environmental and climate justice for the past 15 years. Melina has worked and studied and campaigned in Brazil, Australia, Mexico, Canada and across Europe, focusing on ex resource extraction, climate change, media literacy and Indigenous rights and responsibilities. She's also currently a fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation, where she's focusing on climate change, indigenous knowledge, and renewable energy. She knows firsthand by facing the impacts of the Alberta tar sands in her home community, and she's been a vocal advocate for indigenous rights and environmental justice. For over a decade, Melina has worked on climate and energy as a, as a climate and energy campaigner for Greenpeace Canada and, and with the environmental, Indigenous Environmental Network, um, working on international campaigns. She's written for a variety of publications and produced short documentaries on tar sands, just transition, water issues, and indigenous cultural revitalization. But when it comes to gender justice, that's something at the heart of Melina's personal life and work. She's also worked on the issues of murdered and missing indigenous women in Canada after the suspicious death of her sister Bella, who, whose case still remains unresolved. Melina holds a master's degree in Indigenous Governance at the University of Victoria with a focus on renewable energy and Indigenous communities. She has not just taken her advocacy but, uh, to talk about things, but she's actually put it into practice. And she's recently worked with Kanahus to solarize the Tanya House Warriors project, and she'll continue to build more, more solar projects in Indigenous communities this coming year. 
And most recently, Melina is now the host of a new TV series called Power to the People, which is going to document renewable energy, food security, and eco-housing in Indigenous communities across North America. I'd like to invite Melina to share with us her stories and the importance of women and gender justice in the climate justice movement. You're on mute, sorry, Melina. Thanks, sorry. Tanze Gwakia, Nia Melina Miawapa and Lobokan Masalamia Nihao Kineskunta Nawao. It's an honor to be here with you guys um, talking about these really difficult issues. Um, I know it's really heavy, it lies really heavy on our hearts um, these past couple of weeks and months, I mean, in years really, but I think um, we've actually planned this webinar, uh, you know, many, uh, many, many weeks ago, but you know, seeing um, what the court cases have delivered with continue a continuation of injustice um, for our peoples across um, Turtle Island, I think, you know, really spurs on this conversation of the lack of justice that we see um, in the violence and senseless deaths, really, of our young people, um, Indigenous um, men and women um, and children, girls and boys. Um, and I think that, you know, in this context, we're giving this conversation and also linking it back to um, what a number, you know, many Indigenous people know across Turtle Island of the displacement and forced relocation and essentially uh, encroachment of resource extraction um, and, you know, pushing out um, Indigenous peoples from their homelands, which is creating a disconnection and creating vulnerable um, living situations for a lot of young people that are leaving their communities, um, you know, in, in search of many, many things um, for many reasons, but, you know, for school, for education, for a safer, a safer place to live or for connecting with other communities. Um, and so I think that's kind of the context that we're, we're brought here today. And for me, um, as, you know, as somebody that's worked on trying to stop uh, resource extraction happening in our homelands in the tar sands, um, seeing that very connection of when um, Indigenous women are murdered, um, Indigenous women are violated, um, seeing the very close connection of how, you know, the direct connection of how Indigenous women are um, so closely connected to the earth and how we are, you know, in many, many indigenous communities, the, the water keepers and the, the keepers of, you know, that sacred connection with mother earth, which we is also our mother, I mean, seen as the feminine. And so I think this is why it's so important for us to make these connections. And, you know, it's not something that is very, is separate for us as indigenous peoples. And one of the things too, that I think um, a lot of times people don't necessarily see that are outside of our communities is when the violence happens against Indigenous women, that this is actually the overlap of um, these issues and and how immense that these, when violence happens against our women, like my sister, and I was gonna show, my PowerPoint's not opening today, which is really frustrating, um, but I was gonna show a couple of photos of my sister, but also the, you know, the very close connection that Say, for instance, my sister held to our culture and to our ceremonies and to making um, our tr all, all of our arts, you know, being artisans, um, being closely connected to um, the things that women, you know, the roles that women play in our in our homes and in our communities. And so my sister Bella, whose case still remains unsolved. Um, and it's been about four and a half years. We've been pushing for justice uh, for her case. She was found dead in Toronto uh, three months after she graduated from college uh, in Toronto and we still have no justice uh, for her death and still not all the answers that we need to have complete resolution of you know the fact that my sister's case is still unsolved and enlisted suspicious. Um, it's something that I've worked on many many for many many years and hours after you know evenings and weekends um, but the thing that I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand is that when a woman is goes missing from our communities when a woman is murdered that this actually eats at the very social fabric of our communities in the sense of women are knowledge keepers in our communities and women are the very play a very integral role just like my sister did of of with 
with, along with my other sister Maria, they both went to an you know artisan school where they were learning all of the arts um, from living off of the land and being you know um, continuing our traditions and our cultures and our customs. Um, and so you know we I have I had a, in the powerpoints but slides of picture pictures of Bella um, you know making um, hide and you know, really learning all of the things that our aunties and our cookums um, have passed on. And so I think this is a thing where, you know, we are fighting resource extraction. You know, there's a lot of us like Kanahus and Kanahus' family and Ariel and Ariel's family and my family that, you know, are inheriting um, violence, uh, you know, this type of violence against the land. But at the same time, we're pushing for justice and protection for our women. And this is something that our families, um, are constantly fighting on many, 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 many um, uh, like spheres. It's not just like one thing of environmentalism. It's not just one thing of climate justice. It's actually fighting for justice for for our women, for four-legged ones, for the two-winged ones, for the plant nations, for all the different um, beings that are super integral to all of you know our very existence here in Mother Earth. And so I think that's one of the things that I wanted to introduce and you know continue through this conversation um and i'll keep trying to pull up my powerpoint here but it's it's not it's freezing on me so i'll pass it back to you ariel for now and, and let um Canus and you talk a little bit more and we'll see if this pulls up here hi hi thanks thanks um for those in the in on facebook live i put a link to the case uh bella that was on cbc for you to take a look at. And I think Melina brought up some really important points here that when we have these connections to land as Indigenous people, when the land is destroyed, it literally is a part of destroying who we are. And as women, we are traditionally, our entities, who we are as Indigenous women is directly connected to water. A lot of the struggles that have come to the forefront in the last year have really been centered around this idea that water is life. Water is life was the motto for Standing Rock and the, the No Dapple movement. Water is life has been a move, movement that has been or a slogan that's been utilized in challenging the tar sands and has been for years. Keepers of the Athabasca has utilized, utilized that. But water traditionally for indigenous communities is the responsibility of women. And it's the responsibility of women because we are the water keepers, literally and figuratively. We are the water keepers. We carry our children in our wombs. We carry them in water for nine months and then they're born into the world. We are literally the keepers of life and the keepers of water. And so when we talk about the impacts of not just climate change, but environmental injustices like the Alberta tar sands that are driving climate change to the limits, um, we're talking about the contamination first and foremost to water, which results to the contamination and direct um, insult to injury and to our bodies and to our minds of women. And it's so important that we discuss this because the women, women are disproportionately impacted by both the drivers of climate change and climate change itself. Because we talk about contamination in women and, and water, um, but we're not, it's not just contamination. Climate change, the first thing it impacts on this planet, on Mother Earth, is water. It's impacting our polar ice caps. It's affecting the way that our precipitation and rain patterns are affected. And women absolutely need to be a part of the conversation around restoring that balance. It's not just about restoring you know, the GHG levels in the atmosphere. It's not just about restoring, um, you know, you know, 400 parts per million or the scientific stuff. It's about rebalancing the masculine and the feminine and bringing up leaders that are women that are strong to restore that balance and ending these cycles of trauma and abuse to women that Melina's family has experienced first and foremost, and that too many of our Indigenous women are experiencing every day. And I'd like to bring now Kanahus Manuel onto the call to talk about some of her work that she's been doing uh, to challenge not just the drivers of climate change, but the patriarch and capitalism and the colonial powers that are allowing these things to continue to happen. But first, I want to introduce Kanahus. Uh, Kanahus is a Shikwetmuk. Uh, 
Clitanix and is a member of the Chiquetmic Women's Warrior Society. She's a mother of four and, ha and has a twin sister that lives in the unceded territory of so-called British Columbia. She was born into re Indigenous resistance and land defense, coming from a high-profile political family known for bringing their fight for their traditional territories and homelands into the spotlight from the local to the international level. Kanahus's inheritance of this land struggle has led her to take a leadership role on many Indigenous grassroots front lines. She is well known for her activism and direct actions against the Sun Peaks Ski Resort, Imperial Metals, the Mount Polly mine disaster, and was arrested with other water protectors at Standing Rock. She is currently playing a leadership role in the fight against the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion through more than 500 kilometers of Shequetmuk territory. In a creative form of pipeline resistance, Kanahus and her community spearheaded the tiny house warriors. Our land is our home and building 10 tiny houses to place in the path of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. As a result of her activism, she has been named in several court injunctions and has been jailed by the Canadian state. I just wanna remind you that Melina, with her project with Sol Lubicon Solar is working to solarize those tiny house projects. And it's such a beautiful stop it at the source, stop the pipelines narrative that I just like, it's just so powerful because it's women leading the way. But Kanahus, along with the Shequetmuk Women's Warrior Society and the Tiny House Warriors, issued the Shequetmuk Women's De Declaration against the Kinder Morgan man camps. That this uh, declaration calls for the halt of the construction of an industrial Kinder Morgan man camp threatening to bring 1,000 1, pipeline construction workers, which are a majority of men, into, the Blue, into Blue River, British Columbia, the heart of Shequetmuk territory. These man camps have a direct connection to the increase in the violence against women, including sexual assaults and rape. So I'd like us to all welcome uh, Kanahus, and I'd like you to share some of your work. And I would love to hear more about the tiny house projects and how this fight is really connected to gender justice and climate justice together. Thanks, Kanahus. Thank you. Thank you for our organizing this very, very important topic. Um, like I... Like I said, um, the I've been saying this continually as our as we're fighting against this Kinder Morgan pipeline is that the violence against the land is violence against women, and we hear it all throughout, you know, the world when we're talking to Indigenous people, Indigenous women, and specifically. And one of the things that we are most urgent, urgently addressing right now is the man camp in Blue River, which is really in the heart of our territory. Uh, I'm not sure if you could pull up those maps that I had sent you in the, in the email so we can um, show all the viewers the, where our territory is and how big it is. And it's, it's like around half of the Trans Mountain Pipeline that's being proposed to um, come through our area. Our, our territory starts in the northern part near Jasper. Um, this area has already been impacted, you know, by the, a current day pipeline, the Kinder Morgan pipeline that's already in existence, and that's the old 1953 pipeline that was built without our consent. And that's one of the big things that we are, are, are this webinar is to address too, is that there is no consent um, for this pipeline. There's no consent um, to the Canadian government, to, to Kinder Morgan, to the provincial government, the National Energy Board, um, a, lo a lot of these entities already approving permits um, is actually the Oil and Gas Commission approved the permit for this pipeline to be built in Blue River, which is a thousand man man camp. Um, this is very unsafe for us as Indigenous women in our communities, when we see the documented reports around the man camps. Um, some of these communities around man camps, the violence has tripled. One of these communities in North Dakota had 243 documented reported rapes in one year. Um, this, this is um, not what we wanna see happen anywhere to any of our Indigenous women. We've seen what um, all the news reports just recently about Tina Fontaine, and we're seeing them continuing um, documented news reports of our women going missing and murdered. I would like to say that Canada was actually the first man camp that was established in our territories uh, across Indian country here, and that's with the Hudson Bay Company and the documented reports that 
the 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 new settlers that were invading our lands with the Hudson Bay Company were taking Indigenous wives as young as 12 years old. Um, these are our children, and this is continuing to happen when we see the sex trafficking that is happening around the man camps. Um, a very dangerous situation. Like Melina said, it does break down the social fabric of our societies. It also breaks down the, the economic fabric of our society as, as well, since so many of these men are transient men. They're working men that are leaving their homes and their communities to go to communities that they don't have to be accountable to. And so it doesn't benefit the families at all. We don't see this benefiting families. It's actually in documented cases um, around the tar sands area. They said during, during the Alberta tar sands boom of 2009 that it, it had the regions had the highest um, violence, domestic violence against women. So it's not just the, the violence that's happening to, to women, it's actually to the families. And wherever there's man camps, they're, they're all bad. Every single man camp is equally unsafe. Every man camp is equally sexually violent against women, and we don't want them. We don't want this Kinder Morgan man camp we, after you know, issuing this declaration from the Sukhwatmuk Women Warrior Society and Tiny House Warriors to give our complete opposition to this man camp, that this man camp cannot be built. We want to call for a moratorium of any type of industrial man camps within the Sukhwatmuk territory. Um, we have very urgent um, issues that need to be addressed right now and that's regarding our lands and that the displacement of our lands um, onto the 0.2 percent um, like Ariel mentioned the 0.2 percent of reservation lands within the the country of Canada this is where they want us to remain and that's why we have such systemic issues right now in Indigenous communities because we don't and we can't benefit economically, culturally, socially off the remaining 99.8% um, of our territory that the government claims. If there is to be true reconciliation, like Trudeau is continuing to say, then we need to have our land and we need to have recognition that this land, all 100% of our territory, that remains there is unceded, unsurrendered, and this is the land that we are fighting for. Um, 518 kilometers of this pipeline is proposed to go through our territory. We don't want it there. We don't want these man camps um, to, to be impacting our community. We do not want any more of our Indigenous women murdered or sexually violently attacked in our lands, in our own homes that we should feel safe in. And that's my main, our main message is the safety of our women. Um, to add on about the Tiny House Warriors, uh, our Land is Home project, we are building 10 tiny houses and, and one of the main, the first dances stands we're going to take is against this man camp and we're going to need everybody because it isn't safe it's not safe for us as as the front line as women being the ones on the front line facing off with a thousand men that is not safe we need everybody to stand up we need all of society to stand up this cannot be acceptable in canada where our women are unsafe where there's a thousand men these man camps are known and reported internationally documented. And we need everyone, we need all the men to stand up by our side as well as we stand up and face off and stop this man camp from being built. Sorry, I was muted, uh, unmuted now. Thank you, Kanahus. Uh, I think there were some really, really strong points there, you know, is that, that I really loved your point on the first man camp was when they colonized this, when they came to this country, 
because what we really saw during the first um, first contact was the the destruction and the annihilation of women and the matriarch matriarchal societies that existed in North America. They have documented now that a lot of indigenous communities across North America and across the world had more matriarchal leadership styles or at least shared leadership styles. But when they colonized this country and they colonized this continent, they came here with their own ideologies and views that women were stronger and better than men. And they worked very hard to destroy our songs to destroy our ceremonies, to destroy our role as leaders in taking care of the land, in taking care of our, our economies, taking care of our children, taking care of our education systems. And the amount of trauma that has come with that direct violence against the land, because one of the things we don't also talk about is that Canada has a history of extracting resources. They didn't come here to live in the natural bounty of the new world. They came here to take all of the resources. They came here to strip our lands of the fur and the minerals and the resources that existed below our feet that we lived and worked in harmony with for millennia. So when we talk about violence against the land is a direct threat and violence against our people. And we have to absolutely challenge these systems and stop the status quo and business as usual. And that was that's such a beautiful thing about the tiny house warrior project is that it's it's not this like overt violent attack that they have been putting on us for hundreds and hundreds of years on this continent. But it is subversive and beautiful to build homes, places for people to live when we have housing crises in our communities to build these homes for, for, for people to live in that are powered by renewable energy that are literally challenging the status quo of projects that are producing greenhouse gas emissions that are going into the atmosphere to destabilize the climate more. And who's gonna be the first and foremost to feel those impacts? Indigenous communities, frontline communities, the people that are connected to the land. And those people in those communities that are frontline land-based communities where we get our water directly from the river systems and our food comes directly from the land. It's our women that are going to be contaminated. It's the next generations of children and we have to do whatever it takes to challenge those systems of status quo, business as usual, violence against land, violence against women. Um, the man camps that Kanahus talks about, I have my own personal experience um, with one. I was a part of a documentary and we were they wanted to go and visit one of these camps on the site. And I was like, I don't think we're going to be able to get in. Um, you can't really just go to any site. And the woman that was a part of the filmmaking crew, she was a she was a, a woman of color. So she was dark skin. Her and I were sitting in the front of a car and we just pulled up to one of the sites up near north of Fort McMurray. And she's like, let's just see if we can go in. And we had a male camera guy, but he was in the back seat and he tried to like crouch down and hide. And we got to the security gate and he looks in the vehicle and he looks at both of us as brown women and he just goes, oh, are you guys here for the boys? As if we were um, automatically as brown women in a car, our only role to come up to that camp was to service men. That is a direct experience that I've had. And we have so many stories of sex trafficking, violence against women, abuse against women. It's just out of control. And the fact of the matter is, is these people don't even have, no, they, it's not that they just have a disregard for the earth. They're coming here to destroy, or they're coming to my territory to destroy the lands and territories. They have no regard for the land. They have no regard for the people that have the connection to the land. And they definitely have no regard for our women. The derogatory terms that these people use to describe Indigenous women are things that I can't even repeat on this call. Um, I was really hoping to, to ask a couple questions, but Melina has seemed to have disappeared for a minute. But I really wanted to ask uh, the question to both of you around what you feel, and maybe we can start with you, Kanahus, and when Melina gets back, is like, what do you think is um, one of the why is it so critical, I guess, to discuss violence against the land and violence against women together? 
when discussing climate justice. I talked about my own personal experiences, but why is it to you that we need to talk about gender justice, violence against the land, and violence against women when talking about climate justice? <clears throat> well, I believe I believe in land trauma and that when we physically see the destruction of the land or the pollution of our water or the contamination of our salmon, that we actually feel it. We physically feel it. We emotionally feel it, mentally, spiritually feel it, like it's impacting us. That trauma is, is we are impacted by that trauma. It becomes our trauma as well. There's no differentiating us from the land. and. And we can feel it and we can put a, even a word to it. We could call it land trauma. And I know my one of the sisters out east, you know, she, she dubbed that word. And so it really made sense because all these, you know, unexplained feelings that you're feeling when you physically feel the destruction of your lands. And then the colonization not only brought the destruction of our lands, but it also brought the residential schools and the sexual childhood trauma that these schools had created. And now these intergenerational sexual trauma that is now, you know, passed on to generations and that's what is called intergenerational trauma and, and it exists and we know. And so it's just like the bioaccumulation of heavy metals. It doesn't disappear. It actually accumulates. And this is what we can see happen with trauma as well. If we do not give the love and attention that we need to the next generation. If we don't give that love and attention to the land, it will still remain. And as a birth worker and someone that attends many births and learn from many different Indigenous midwives from around the world, the sacredness of our babies and our wombs and that, that reproduction of this new life, it is so powerful and sacred that it's the most powerful ceremony that any woman could ever be a part of is that birthing ceremony and that connection that we have to our children and the connection that we have to our mothers and our, and our grandmothers and how this came from the beginning of time. We've been passed down, inherited, you know, all the teachings, all the struggles, all the beauty, all the everything. But now we're inheriting, you know, this defense for our lands. And it's so much a part of our defense of our children it's like you can't you can't separate it as indigenous mothers. So when they're destroying the water, it's like they're destroying our children and we're not going to let them destroy our children or kill our children or kill our water. We're going to stand up and and it is going to take the women and the mothers because of that sacred connection that we have with our children and the nation. We birthed the nation and so when we say violence, you know, against the land, they're putting through this pipeline that's coming from the Alberta tar sands that hurting the grandmothers up there and the mothers and the sisters and all of our aunties up there. Those are our relatives that they're impacting. You know, your mother, your mother. I have, a, you know, a close relationship with your mother. You know, Ariel, like I, so, you know, I, that just that connection, that sacred connection between a mother and a child and a mother and a daughter that's continued on. Um, it's so powerful and that's what they're impacting and that's why it's so urgent for us to stand up because without, with this pipeline going through and with this dirty tar sands oil being proposed to come through our territory, it's um, the new wrath, it's the new, this new the new form of this Western expansion. It's like the transportation corridors, the railways, the, the pipelines, the fiber optic lines, everything that's making this economy continue to flow and build, become this super economic power, you know, in the world is off the backs of us. And it's off the violence and the, and the, and the rape of our land and our women. And we're not going to tolerate any anymore. And we saw it this past week throughout Canada. Our people have, are saying that they had enough. So let's get organized. But this is like a, the good beginning part of this conversation that I want to continue to see happen across this whole country because only mm -hmm. then are we going to really get organized as the mothers of this nation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kanahus. Um, Melina, I want to pose the same question to you. Is uh, I don't know if you, you heard the question, but it was really looking at why is it so important 
to discuss violence against the land and violence against the women together when discussing climate justice issues? Um, I, so I, the reason why I was off the screen is I was in a different computer trying to get the PowerPoint. So I just emailed it to you, Ariel, so you can okay. bring up some images if possible. Thanks yep. for that. I'll Sorry, it's not coming from my screen. I will get it up as soon as I okay. can. So there is a number one and number two just because they're big files. So could you show the number two first? I, I just got to open up the, the link. So maybe if you can just try and answer the question. Do you know which, sorry, do you know which email you sent it to? I'm just the Arial Gmail one. Okay. Oh, I there think it is. it's Arial as well. Yep. Yep. I got it. Number two first, please. Number two. Um, yeah, I think I think one of the reasons why I know when I was talking with Ken Hoos about this last month about the need for this type of webinar um, to make this these types of connections, um, even for the environmental movement itself. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, um, there's there can be this this kind of siloed work. Um, you know, speaking to the movement, because I think that's probably a lot of people that are watching this right now, but um, the siloed work of um, focusing solely on what is the environment. And I think that's one of the things that our people um, in these movements have been, you know, communicating with our non-Indigenous allies and brothers and sisters that, um, you know, this this issue is a lot bigger um, in, in the sense of, um, Oh, I didn't send the whole thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, if you can go to seven, that would be, that would, or next one, actually. Actually, go to the, go to two up, um, number five, and I'll start there, number five. Okay. Yeah. Um, but just to finish that point, just for the, I know there's brothers and sisters watching um, in non-Indigenous communities, and, and, you know, this is the one of the things that, um, you know, that we've said um, throughout the years of this work is that the the cultural connections, the um, human rights abuses, all of these types of um, issues are not separate from what environmental justice needs and sh needs to look like. And I think that is now I know in the back in the in the past, it was not necessarily heard as well. And I think that we're getting into a new era where this is being heard, where we do have to realize um, how to figure out how to work together, and incorporate the multitude of these issues, including gender justice, including um, and how what how does that interface with climate justice? Um, and so this picture here, um, you know, talking about um, to the points that I was making earlier of the cultural and environmental genocide, um, you know, with the further encroachment, contamination and destructive, um, destructive natures of resource extractions in our territories is actually resulting in a further loss of culture, tradition and customs. Um, and I, and this is already on top of, you know, with with the environmental racism that we see, this is already another a new onslaught of, you know, what many call neo colonialism, neo um, through resource extraction. And so that's for me, it's, you know, wanting our indigenous brothers and sisters to understand um, through this, what we've, you know, which I also call like in this this um, PowerPoint presentation is called neo neo reconciliation because um what does that actually mean what does reconciliation mean in the era of this of the truth and reconciliation and one of the issues um the the thing that i did appreciate about the trc was it did call out the cultural genocide and it used the word genocide which is one of the first kind of um a lot of people in canada do not like to admit that genocide happened here and like kanu Hoos had um pointed out earlier genocide was alive and well um through the raping and pillaging of our communities and the raping of of women and that's what you know the onslaught the first onslaught of um colonialism was through um the violation of our women and i think you know we see this continue on and so i think a lot of times when i travel and talk about um internationally and travel and talk about murdered missing women in canada and the fact that the numbers are so high you know they're up to over 4000 murdered missing women and people are shocked and surprised that that is the case and you know for us in indigenous communities when um, you know, our ancestors and our, you know, immediate family have seen that perpetuated or our grandparents um, have seen that perpetuated of the violation of women um, since colonialism, colonization happened. I think it's 
it's unfortunately no shock and surprise, even though it's a very difficult lived reality and lived experience to be inheriting and um, dealing with on a daily basis. And so if you can go to, um, I thought that, sorry, I thought I separated it because I don't want to show the whole presentation. No, it's okay. But um, if we go to, uh, let's see, um, the the top part of the presentation, um, if you go to the top, yeah. Um, no, so maybe actually. The other one? Um, yeah, that's weird. Um, sorry, I thought I separated it. Nine, number. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. That's okay. Hmm. I okay. Yeah, here, let's start. Let's start there. Okay. Um <clears throat> what number are you going to? Okay, let's go to um seven. Sorry. And then I might not I just might not have to use these because it's a little bit I just wanted to show people. Um so going back to the TRC and the fact that, you know, in the TRC, the United ne Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is upheld as a piece of international legislation that needs to be adhered to. Um, in, in the 94 recommendations of the TRC, um, I counted and, you know, I don't, it'd be interesting if other people counted, but I, I saw the UNDRIP named 22 different times in that, in the, um, in the TRC. And so the, the funny thing and the ironic thing is, and one of the reasons why we wanted to call out you know and say no no consent to trudeau um in this webinar because you know this this violation of our women when trudeau the government of canada decides to continue to pass the kinder morgan pipeline and approve the kinder morgan pipeline you know once again our communities do not have the consent even though you know it's upheld canada's signatory of undrip um it's named in the trc um for allowing free prior and informed consent and yet we do not have the ability to say no to man camps. We do not have the ability to say no to these camps that are placed right beside our communities um, and that are um, in direct violation of the ability to say no when resource extraction is happening. And then we see the outcomes of underage um, sex workers, um, young children being violated. There's been documented cases in the Dakotas um, of you know, young children being violated in these camps, um, an increased rate of um, abuse, substance abuse um, in these camps, um, which obviously leads to very precarious situations in and around communities when people are under the substance in, um, under the influence of, um, you know, substances like alcohol and drugs. Um, a lot of what we've seen in the tar sands is workers that essentially are trying to stay awake. Um, and so because they're working 12 hour days for three, three weeks on one week off, um, constantly. And so a lot of, um, from our discussions with many people, um, indigenous and non-indigenous that people are, you know, abusing substances to even stay awake, um, through their shifts, um, to, and so these are the types of kind of, dynamics that are created in and around communities that aren't used to dealing with this types these types of um substance abuses and then also you know violence against women if you can go to um scroll down a little bit sorry i thought i i can't sorry i can't even pull this up i wish i could pull it up on my own community and in my own com computer um but I think, you know, um, if you can go to the end of it, Ariel, I'm just going to show the, the violence against women pictures. This is weird. I, this is not the right one. I don't think it's not the, the right one. one. Can you I'll pull open the other yeah. one? Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing for one second. And okay. And I'll go pull it up the other one so that everyone doesn't see your email. That's all right. I don't mind. People can <laughs> email me. Um, but I don't, yeah, so that's kind of, I just wanted to show a couple of the last pictures of, um, connecting violence against women uh, in in our communities. But Canus, did you, and I know we're coming up to like the hour and we did want to open it up to questions um, for the last half an hour of this webinar to kind of interact with folks that are watching online to allow questions to come in and bring up other issues that people, yeah. you know, would want to have addressed. But Canus, oh, do you have anything else that you wanted to add before um, we go into, or even tomorrow, if you wanted to announce the, yeah, I was, the event that's happening tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would love to talk about just, just, just. I'd like to ask one more question, which kind of ties into the. It would be a good segue. Is for me the last question I wanted to ask you guys was, 
what is the role of allies, both men and white allies, in helping to change this narrative, in helping to address like violence against women and climate justice together? And I really thought this would be a good time for you to plug some of the great stuff that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I just want to open that question to both of you. So what is the role of allies, both men and like settler allies, in helping to change this narrative and really addressing the gender justice and climate justice and violence against the land and violence against women. What can we do? What can they do? Okay. Um, I think that um, we really need our men at our side right now, and that we've we've seen so many times that our that our our men has have been a part of the violence. Our own men have been a part of the violence and disrespect of our own women and that really needs to change but also we need to have a, a really mutual respect between our roles in our indigenous societies of our men and our women and and another thing i, I believe is that men uh, men and non-indigenous allies that that really want to support are going to find ways that they're going to use their skills to be able to support we had amazing people come forward to um you know offered to do a, a music compilation album to raise funds for the Tiny House Warriors uh, project. And it was volunteer. It was all volunteer and out of the goodness of their heart to be able to come and do this. And we have 40 plus artists that contributed songs and music to this album that shows that there is a real collective voice. Um, to protect the land and to protect the women uh, against this Kinder Morgan man camp and this pipeline. And so we, we see people stepping up and taking their own initiative and I think that's what we really need to do because of the urgency. We need to organize running. We can't be taking a lot of times and, and trying to find places where people could fit in. We just got to fit in and just organize okay. running and let's stop this pipeline. Oh, you're on mute, Ariel. Uh, thanks, Kanahoos. That's really great. We're going to share a link to the event that's happening tomorrow night. Um, it's called the Tiny House uh, Warrior Album Release at the Rickshaw in Vancouver. So I'm going to put, post it in the chat box right now. So take a look at it when you have the opportunity because it's going to be a great event and it's a way for you to get involved, learn more about the Tiny Warrior House project as well as, you know, support <laughs> supporting the Tiny House Warrior Project, because more than anything, uh, I'm going to say this, I'm going to plug it now, um, we, we all need support. Our projects are not highly funded like most other projects. We need all the support we can get through all the different fundraisers. I encourage you to take a look at the, um, at the Tiny House Warrior Project mm -hmm. that we posted us here as well and, and donate and, and get involved and trying to really challenge those narratives. Um, Melina, do you have anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I've really, I think is really important um, when we talk about this transition, you know, we talk about um, patriarchy and I think patriarchy affects all women. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now is the rebalancing of the masculine and feminine. And I think, you know, there is no, um, like that is that is really what's happening um where we do see this rebalancing of the feminine taking back um power um to rebalance it as opposed to it being unbalanced I'm, across the globe and i think it's a slow and painful process though um it's you know not without um a lot of um pain and agony and burden on the shoulders of women um to be the strong warriors that we always have been in our communities, um, a part of, you know, decision making, a part of um, planning for the future. And I think we see, you know, in many communities, Indigenous and non-Indigenous women taking back that role. And um, I think that's an amazing thing. And I'd say for our allies, our, you know, the male allies, um, I think, you know, being a part of that transition being a part of ushering and helping and supporting the women because it's it's a really tiring job sometimes and i think when women always have to be the ones to call out patriarchy um, and then receive the backlash sometimes that is a very tiring place to be as well and i think 
like Hanu said, the men need to stand with us, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, in calling out patriarchy and not always leaving it to the women to call out the patriarchy. Um, that the men need to very strongly stand with us and, and name it when it needs to be named. And I think that's a, a really big lesson and something that, you know, even the like hashtag Me Too movement is, you know, seeing um, where I still think more men need to to support the women. Um, and I think we see that a little bit, but I think as women gain, continue to gain um, their rightful roles in, in, that, in that place and that balance and that equilibrium of power um, that men, you know, as, as being the benefactors in the, you know, having that privilege of patriarchy, um, I think that they need to be a part of that continual support and calling out. Um, just like we do need our allies to continue, um, non-Indigenous al allies to continue to call out white supremacy and to continue to call out, um, you know, systems of, of oppression that really affect our communities in such detrimental ways, um, you know, because we're still not on equal playing level. We're still not there yet, but we're, we are gaining traction. And I think um, making these connections is a part of, a part of the strengthening and understanding um, and deepening of of knowledge and, and mutual respect and understanding um, with everyone in this movement, and so that's probably what I would say um, to our our allies Thanks. and our, our men. So we are going to open it up to some questions. Um, I got a couple coming in already, but I just really wanted to sort of uh, just sort of play one more plug. One more thing here is that there are lots of ways to support these projects in communities and frontline communities and particularly Indigenous women led projects. Indigenous Climate Action itself is an Indigenous woman led uh, initiative. It's all Indigenous women, all working on climate justice issues, trying to find ways to raise the profile of not just gender justice, climate justice issues, but of climate justice in general and the need for voices. Just yesterday, one of our steering committee members, uh, Jesse Cardinal, was at a climate leadership, Indigenous climate leadership conference here in Edmonton, Alberta, where I'm uh, reporting from today. And she talked about how the Minister of Environment sat down with all these chiefs and leaders and he made a comment that, wow, there's a lot of testosterone at this table. And we really need to be challenging that because a lot of the men have been making some deci making decisions on behalf of our communities. And we really need to break the status quo, not just of breaking the status quo of business as usual for corporations and oil and gas companies, but the status quo of how decisions are being made and who's making those decisions for us. I really, really think that we absolutely have to be doing what Melina talked about is restoring that balance and bringing women to the forefront and finding ways to change the narrative, not just of climate justice and what climate justice looks like, but what uh, the pathway to achieving climate justice look like. It's going to have to absolutely include women. And we have to end the madness that has happened for the last 400, 500 years on this continent. And more importantly, um, you know, there are actions that we can all take right now. Support women in your community. Challenge these drivers of climate change. No more man camps. We don't need any more, like Kanahu said. But those man camps exist in like in the tens of thousands like there are 70,000 workers in Alberta's tar sands right now most of them in these massive scale man camps and it's not like the projects have suddenly stopped because we're talking about climate change in Canada there are new approvals of projects all the time every year new projects are being approved and right now the largest ever proposed open pit mine is being proposed 17 kilometers from the boundary of my community settlement and it will absolutely include a man camp because it will be considered the most rural and remote tar sands operation to date and they will have to build a road to a place that has no road and they will have to build a camp in a place that'll be 17 kilometers from a settlement that has never had anything near it like this before there will be increases of drug sex trafficking all of the problems that we talk about we need to be challenging the status quo of all of the business as usual of every single aspect of this industry and it's not just tar sands it's the Bakken oil it's fracked gas in eastern Canada it's the shale gas in other parts of the country it's the natural gas reserves in Anwar Gulf of Mexico Bayou Bridge there are so many things and projects we can engage but we should support be supporting women as leaders in these discussions so 
the first question that I have for Kanahus and uh, Melina comes from Shannon McKay. She says, what are the next steps we can take to help? Um, so I think there's the, the rickshaw event tomorrow, but what are tangible steps that people can do to help? Anything? You're on oh, mute, yeah, Kanahus. <laughs> okay. Um... There's so much ways that people could help, and I think that even just spreading this webinar around is like the first step is send this to other people so they could be more aware of, of these issues and start these conversations in your home communities with the other women in your communities. And, and a few women could create a lot of change, and, and don't underestimate the power of three women, four women, five women. They could they can do so much, and, and so have, you know, have the faith in ourselves to be able to to take these leadership roles in our communities because we know what is best for our people and um to continue to bring awareness to all the the people like these indigenous women led movements and organizations and uh, that are doing such amazing work everywhere we need to continue to support them like like ariel was saying and get your boots on the ground like there's there's march 10th there are people calling out to help with the tsuela tooth and their project to stop this pipeline there's other grassroots frontline fights that are going to be sparking up all across this proposed pipeline route so being on the ground and and helping and supporting in that way on cook's job thanks uh melina um i think one of the ways too is um like hanu said is is boots on the ground. So how do we continue to solarize Indigenous communities? And I, you know, one of the slides I wanted to show was about just transition and what does just transition mean um, in the era of climate justice and gender justice and, and what do solutions look like in our communities? And that's, I think, one of the things of empowering our communities to do the work in our communities. And I think that's why, for me, um, it was so, amazing to be able to receive the support um, for, because we put up a solar project back home in um, our home territory in the tar sands. And then from that experience, I wanted to, how do I give, you know, have this experience benefit other indigenous communities? And, you know, I was really happy to be able to work with Kanahus um, on uh, these, like solarizing the tiny house warriors. And we have a video up on online. If you guys haven't seen it already, it's, um, talking about this type of transition and, and seeing renewable energy as a way forward um, to transition out of the dependency on fossil fuel extraction um, because our communities have been you know have been you know experiencing the brunt of resource extraction um, and climate change as we've been talking about so i think supporting the tiny house warriors um, through, you know, if you can't be boots on the ground through donations and if you know, for future solar bills, um, you know, we'll have a call out for in Lubicon Solar. You can look on our Facebook web page, watch our latest video of uh, us solarizing the Lubicon, uh, uh, the solar project um, being um, implemented in Sequetmic territory. So you can watch um, the video either on Tiny House Warriors or uh, Lubicon Solar um, Facebook page and, and watch the video and then there's ways to support and kind of join in um, to figure out future ways that we're going to be doing um, some more tiny house builds but also solarizing at the same time and I was just so grateful um, for a brother that came that he actually was in Standing Rock and um, he was uh, solarizing there and then um, you know through IEN we were able to connect and Dallas um, connected us and so I invited him up um, to come help us solarize in Sequetmic territory and I think um, the kind of being able to have indigenous um, solidarity between indigenous nations from north to south and east to west I think is something that was really exciting to see and so I think supporting these types of initiatives where you see indigenous communities um, essentially um, looking at what does um, yeah, what does uh, Indigenous sovereignty look like in our territories? And I think that's um, what's really exciting about this new era of um, finding support in that way. So getting involved, I think, in in any of these initiatives are coming out, yeah, in Slay with Tooth March 10th. If you guys are in unceded Coast Salish territories, come out to Protect the Inlet on March 10th. Um, you can go to the website there, protecttheinlet.ca, um, to find out more. 
um, and go to the other websites to find out more of how you can plug in. You know, it was amazing to see um, brothers and sisters in Victoria send a built house over. Um, yeah, you can go to lubaconsolar.ca, Indigenous Climate Action, figure out how to plug in and support um, Tiny House Warrior initiatives as well. So that's all I'll say for now. Thank you, Melina. Um, yeah, there's so many great ways to get involved. Um, one really good question that is coming all the way from my brother in uh, Atoera is Tiano. Tiano sends a message, everybody. Uh, I think, Tiano, who's you bet Tiano, haven't you? Maybe, I don't know. Tiano is amazing. <laughs> Hi, Tiano. Um, but he says, how can we build global solidarity between our indigenous struggles? And I think that that's really, really important because the reality is, is that sometimes people go from North America, go to other places to support indigenous struggles in other places and don't think about the struggles here or or they get really involved with the struggle here and don't realize that this is a global issue. Indigenous people are represented worldwide. We're about 5% of the global population right now. Um, and what's really interesting though, when we talk about climate justice and why it's so important to talk about indigenous people and climate justice is that of the 5% of the population, 80% of the world's biodiversity is within indigenous territories. So if you're serious about climate justice, you need to be serious about supporting indigenous rights and sovereignty and self-determination. Um, I really wanna go back to Melina's point about the TRC mentioning UNDRIP and our right to say no and giving consent is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The foundation of that document is self-determination, sovereignty, and ultimately free prior informed consent. If we are, and that's not just for the lands and resources, that's for our education, that's for our health and security of our communities, that's for our housing, that's for our, the protection of our medicines and plants and lands and territories and food security. And climate change and the drivers of climate change threaten everything. And if we are saying no to these projects that violate every aspect of our life and we have the rights recognized, then we have the right to say no. And I just think that that struggle is international. So uh, the question from Tiano is, how do we bring the international indigenous struggles together for more solidarity? That's a big question. <laughs> I mean, some of the, oh, go ahead, you wanna go? Oh, go ahead, Melina. <laughs> Some of the, I think some of the amazing stuff that I've seen, um, you know, even with um, the Indigenous, um, the Maori brothers and sisters in Aotearoa um, is, is kind of the, the cross-cultural exchanges that ha I know that have been happening even here in Squamish territory. A lot of Squamish folks have come over to, into Aotearoa to do those cultural exchanges of preservation and um, revitalization of Indigenous languages and culture and ceremony. Um, and I think that's an amazing basis of Indigenous solidarity. But also we've been talking about how do we um, even do like share kind of organizing um, organizing knowledge. Um, and so even when I was in Aotearoa um, last year, uh, we talked about bringing, um, you know, many of us have been involved with um, Indi the Indigenous pa Peoples, IP3, um, Indigenous Peoples Power Project, where it talks about training and organizing and understanding different ways of campaigning and sharing this type of, of knowledge with one another, I think is, you know, how to be effective in, in getting um, the messages out there. Um, how do we create divestment, you know, divestment movement? How do we create the solidarity and awareness between and put to, between communities that where we can, sh you know, because ultimately multinational corporations are in all of our homelands. And I think that's when we can create solidarity with one another um, is so important. Like we saw in, in, uh, in Ecuador, where we have our brothers and sisters that are being, you know, we have Chevron um, in Texaco that dumped billions and billions of cubic liters of toxic sludge and oil before they left um, the Amazon and holding these corporations accountable up here in the north that they have assets in Canada and that's why we see legal court cases from our indigenous brothers and sisters in the south. Those types of um, kind of not recognizing the these uh, kind of made up boundaries um, but like being in solidarity with one another, raising the alarm bells in the different places where they need to be heard, I think is a strong 
um, thing for Indigenous solidarity to continue to happen and what we've seen happening in the past. Great. Kanahus? I think it's really important for for us to, when we look at Indigenous solidarity, to look at that, that we are Indigenous people. How do we show solidarity to other Indigenous people? It's always the other way where it's like non-Indigenous people showing us solidarity and, and they define what that solidarity is. And, and I believe that it's going to be just taking these small projects um, or what would seem like a smaller project, like installing one tiny house with solar um, like me and Melina and, and we worked on together, but then it was also another brother that came up, you know, from, from the South. And, and it was, so it was a collaboration between three Indigenous nations. And when we go off to our other nations that also collects, connects us, um, those political ties, those, even the friendships and the relationships that, that everything's so political, like with, with the work that we do that, that that's who we end up loving and that's who we end up holding close to our hearts or are the same people that are doing this exact same work because we become a bigger movement family collective voice and and I think it's through smaller projects like that like we would love to do some type of collaboration between between, between the Sokotmok and any other type of Indigenous nation out there because that's how we're going to build that power and that people power and our you know our sovereignty and we're standing on these same issues of self-determination and and we have to find creative ways to do this and pull our nations together before we had big, huge, um, like political marriages that brought nations together. You know, we had political trades that we that kept our nations together. Those are the types of things that I would like to to see happening. Yeah, I think it's really important to to draw those lines of connections as um you know indigenous peoples giving solidarity to indigenous peoples because we are so much stronger when we work together and we have internationally recognized rights that are for all of us um and we have those same recognized rights and that is one of the things that brings us together and we've seen that really come to the forefront of the international climate negotiations um or at the permanent forum on indigenous issues where we see indigenous peoples from all across the world coming together and when you have those conversations you realize that our struggles are no different our languages might be different, our songs might be different, um, our ceremonies might be different, but the issues that we face are the same. We are fighting entrenched white supremacy, <laughs> we're fighting capitalism, and we're fighting colonialism. Colonialism isn't something that ended, it continues every single day for Indigenous people worldwide. Um, and that really gets into this Next question, because for me, like I think of colonialism as Melina talked about it, neo-colonialism is the extraction of our resources. They make it seem as though in Canada we're, we're all good and now we have truth and reconciliation and we're, we're trying to mend our relationships and work together in this country, but at the same time, they're still extracting our resources. They're still, you know, letting people get away literally with murder of our young people, of our young women, of our children, um, and millions of unresolved cases uh, of murder and mis murdered and missing Indigenous women, like the, the colonial project still exists right now. Um, and the resource extraction is just one of those really big symptoms that I think when we talk about climate justice and gender justice, we can, we can do things together. And so Heidi, Vert, Vert Haller says, how can we work together to make sure that we stop all of these pipeline corridors or companies all over Turtle Island that are running uh, roughshod over the interests of the people and our ecology and continuing to build their projects without proper legal permits? So how can we stop all of the pipelines <laughs> across Turtle Island? Just a little question. How do we stop all the pipelines? How do we? Basically, I think she's asking, how do we stop the colonial project and the patriarch? Anyone? Come on. Well, I mean, we've already we've already seen, fortunately, six success stories of stopping pipelines um, on a multiple on multiple fronts. Um, we've seen the Enbridge pipeline um, fall dead in the water, and that was with many of us working together from the source of the problem all the way through the corridor with the Yinka Dene Alliance all the way out to the coast. And you know, it was this this 
again, alliance, the alliances of the indigenous nations that did like a freedom train ride all the way out to Ottawa that was supported by allies across the country. So we saw um, court cases. Um, it, it's a multi-pronged approach essentially is what we need to see every time we're addressing a pipeline fight or a resource extraction fight, that it needs to be from the source of the problem to the, the terminus, like we're seeing in the Kinder Morgan pipeline now. The same thing, what we're talking about with the Kinder Morgan where we have you know, indigenous communities from the source um, all the way out to the West Coast and all the way supported from communities. That's how we saw the Energy East pipeline get quashed. Also the KXL pipeline. That was through many, many people working together, indigenous and non-indigenous allies working together, um, addressing this issue, um, doing it in a, like, so like, you know, they're, Test of, like I testified before U.S. Congress in on the KXL pipeline. Like there, there's so many people that were doing so many things on so many different levels, legally, on the ground, grassroots. Um, so yeah, it was just it was amazing to see the the type of solidarity that um, that's that's what you know people power is what kills these pipelines, and so that's how we stop these types of pipelines by working together and not being divided. Like, um, you know, the left is always constantly divided and we, we allow ourselves to be divided sometimes and sometimes it's, you know, divide and conquer tactics. And I think um, if as much as possible, um, pushing through those divide and conquer tactics and, and just working together to be able to empower one another, sharing knowledge and information about um, these dirty projects um, so that our all communities are informed before they consent, you know, because many of them, a lot of times, it's not even the ability to consent. It's it's that really these communities, many communities do not, are not receiving the information to be fully informed about before actually signing on to these projects. And that's one, one thing that's very problematic about um, these types of issues. So the share, the sharing of knowledge and information is, is also key. I just pulled up the map so people can see all the, the tar. This is tar sands, just tar sands pipelines, by the way. There are many, 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 many other bad pipelines and projects. I, I would just like to add, I agree with everything what Melina said. It's going to take people power, multi-prong, you know, approach. We're going to have to have so much different weapons in our arsenal, um, like intellectual, like direct action, like everything, the legal, the political, the social work that needs to be all done. But also, I would like I would really like to add um, what the Unistoten camp had really brought up in in my in my mind and my heart about like what does free prior informed consent really look like and and you have to go through this free prior informed consent protocol to even step foot into their their clan's territory and that's like who are you where your lineage from what skills do you have to offer and if we allow you um, access into our territory how are you going to benefit this nation's territory or leave this place a better place and and you really have to look at yourself as an individual and what skills you have to make this place a better place. And I think that's the, the free prior informed consent that not just corporations have to go to and government have to go through, but individuals that are benefiting, being able to drink clean water, live on clean land and breathe clean air here in, in, in so-called Canada. We all have to point the fingers at our solution. We could point our fingers all day at Kinder Morgan, the Canadian government and everything, but as long as we, you know, we have to start pointing the fingers at ourselves and saying, how are we going to be a solution now? Yep. We know the problem. How are we going to individually be a solution? Because it's going to take every single one of us. No one gets excused from this one because we all depend on this water and clean air and this and this land. And so um, I thank you for everybody that already doing this work and this amazing, amazing work that has contributing to where we are today. And it's going to take more And these young people that are coming up. The majority of our indigenous population are the young people and are the youth and we need you we need you by um, our side and any young people that want to reach out to to any one of us you know we're here we want to be mentors and 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 teachers too and exchange skills as well yeah um i think this is this is it you know like we're at a moment we're at a moment where we either change the narrative we change the story and we support those that have been marginalized and left out of the conversation, or we continue business as usual. And part of that is bringing the young people up to the forefront, bringing our young women 
teaching our people that they are leaders, that they are stewards of the land and re-engaging in and reaffirming that our culture and connection, connection to land is going to be one of the most powerful and vital solutions to the climate crisis. I think like this is so, so important. It's not just about like giving land back to indigenous people. Um, there's a lot of talk around decolonization and decolonize the environment, decolonize the environmental movement. And I really, really want to just sort of let people know decolonization doesn't have to be complicated. It's really simple. It's a return of and connection to the land. So you, we need to return the land back to the rightful owners and we all as humanity need to reconnect to the land. And once we do that, the solutions will come because when you have that relationship with the land, with the water, with the animals, our brothers and sisters and the planet, those solutions become more natural. We learn how to adapt to the changing climate, which is we're already there. Climate change is happening and it's changing. And the people that are gonna be able to adapt to these climates the most are gonna be land-based people. They're gonna have the solutions. And so when we talk about culture and ceremonies, those things reconnect us to the land. That is a part of decolonization. And I just think that if you wanna stop and you wanna find a way to stop all these projects, start decolonizing your mind, start reconnecting with the land, start listening to what the wind says to you, what the water says to you, what those that are connected to the land say to you, because that's how we're gonna stop these projects and putting our bodies on the line, <laughs> challenging the stat status quo of business as usual, whether it's divestment or intervening in the regulatory system or protesting in the streets or blockading or building you know, projects like the tiny houseware projects. We have to be reaffirming our connection to the land and stopping the machine. Um, there hasn't, there isn't really a lot of more questions. I just really think that there was a really good point. Um, Teresa or Teresa Turner said that we need cross-border stimulate or simultaneous direct action to start operations on multi-links of the fossil fuel capitalist value chain. And I think that's such a really, really good point because business and commerce and literally the resources, they freely pass through that medicine line. Yet, as Indigenous people, we had families and tribes and nations split by this arbitrary line, and we're not even allowed, we're like basically vilified if we try to do cross-border strategies, and I think we definitely need some real cross-border strategies. Uh, and, and I know that Kanahus and Melina, you've both been involved with cross-border strategies, really working on the other sides of the borders, um, and, and I just think that it's, it's just such a powerful thing, and you know, someone said, together, we are all stronger. And I really do think that that is really, really the big key to hit home is together we are stronger, whether it's across the borders between Canada and the United States, Canada and Mexico, or if it's all the way on the other side of the globe, we really need to be connecting our struggles together. I'd like to offer you both some time to offer some closing words um, to people and anything you want to say to wrap this up and we're at the top of uh, at the end of our time so i just want to thank both of you for coming and everyone for listening and uh, melina or at ken who's close us off you're on mute you're, on mute. <laughs> you're on mute again <laughs> okay um yeah my 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 ending comment is for canada and uh we're done with you, you know, destroying our land, approving these permits, approving these pipelines, approving the tar sands, you know, mines. We're done with that. And they're going to have to face off with us, you know, on the ground. And this is where it's coming to as Indigenous women, is that when we see our women cry, when we see our young people cry, at the hands of the Canadian state, at the hands of corporations, and we are done. We're done with their colonial government. And it's going to really take us as the mothers and the, and the, and the caretakers and the life givers, the one that, that really love our people and our nation and our children and our water to stand there with no fear and to be very courageous in this time because we are facing 
off of a, one of the biggest, you know, tyrants out there, you know, these, this colonial, you know, capitalist structure. And where, you know, I, I pray for, you know, all of, all of the women that have the courage to stand up and to all of those ones out there that are just right there, they're almost there, like for them to break free and to be able to join all of the courageous women that are standing up. And I have faith that we're going to be able to accomplish great things, you know, as, as the, the young women here in our movements. And we're asking for all of the men, all of the men and our brothers and our uncles, you know, to be there as our brothers and our uncles and our, and, and as father figures and grandfather <clears throat> figures to stand with us. And for all of our mothers and the aunties and the sisters and the, and the grandmothers to, to stand with us. And we, and we need everyone at this time, you know, to, to shut this tar sands down, you know, to keep these pipelines from not being built and protect our water. And our future generations. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Kanahus. Masicho. Okay. Um, I just want to do a big like call out to all of the Indigenous brothers and sisters and our non-Indigenous allies that have been doing this work um, to working towards decolonization and decolonizing our minds. And we are in a time of prophecy and we are in a time where the seventh generation, the next generations will be free of a co colonial mind. And we see that in our young ones. We see that in our youth. Um, but there's also this colonial co colonization project happening, which is, you know, muddying for some of our youth, um, seeing what, you know, with social media, the impact of the media. Um, so how do we continue to to break free of um, of these these times of prophecy. And so I think, you know, I wanted to give a shout out for all the work that's being done for all the violence against Indigenous women's violence against women organizations out there on the front lines, um, protecting our women, um, the Native Youth Sexual Health work, Network um, that, you know, all the amazing people that work there, um, all those beautiful human beings that have been making this connection between gender justice, gender justice and violence against women, um, all of our um, lesbian, gay, and transgendered brothers and sisters that are in this fight with us that struggle and, and face a lot of oppression and violence against them in their lives. We stand with you and we we hoped and we want to have more dialogue around these issues of, of um, the different genders that exist within our communities and deserve to be respected and protected. And I think um, this is one conversation out of many that we have and we'll be inviting more brothers and sisters in um, you know, into these conversations uh, to include more than just, you know, two genders. And so I think that's, um, that's something that's really important to a lot of us here on this call. And I know that um, there's, there's a lot of violence perpetuated against our, our um, lesbian, gay and transgendered um, family members. And so um, I just want to give a shout out to all that good work that's being done to all of the people that uh, stand with us, all of the organization and people that sit with us and, and all the hard work, and all the artists, musicians, and all the amazing people that do this good work with us um, and, and uh, inspire our hearts and our minds. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you, Melina. So I just want to thank both Kanahus and Melina for coming and having this really rich conversation around gender, justice, violence against the land, violence against women, and, and uh, really just how we can stop business as usual and end and, and patriarchy and begin working towards full decolonization. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Indigenous Climate Action. Indigenous Climate Action is Canada's uh, premier Indigenous-led climate justice organization. So it makes us unique is that we're fully Indigenous-led by Indigenous women. And all of the projects that we talked about today, including Lubicon Solar at lubiconsolar.ca, Tiny, Warrior, Tiny House Warriors, um, which is tinyhousewarriors.ca, is, or tinyhousewarriors.com. Uh, indigenousclimateaction.com. I encourage you all to look at our websites. Every single one of our websites has a donate button. A lot of these projects really need your support financially and also to just get the word out. We need your support to get the word out on our work and our stories. Indigenous Climate Action is going to be working to create a whole webinar series on climate justice issues for Indigenous communities, whether it's housing, gender justice, water rights, land rights. We really want to be developing these stories, bringing forth really great Indigenous voices to the forefront because we are our own experts. 
That is the bottom line. Indigenous people are the own expert, our own experts. We don't need anyone else speaking for us. We don't need anyone else to represent us. What we need is people creating the spaces for us and supporting the work that we're doing and making sure that it's getting known, getting heard, and that we are a part of decision-making matters when it comes to our communities. So I encourage you all to get online, check out all of our organizations, support all of the amazing work that's being done by these beautiful women. Um, I do also really think you should go and check out the Native Sexual Health Network. I can't remember, it's Ninshi, I always get it wrong. Um, we'll put it in the link um, on the Facebook chat, but they have done such tremendous work to talk about violence on the land and gender justice issues, and they've done some tremendous work. They have a really great publication called um, Our Land, Our Bodies, um, and I think that we sh people should be looking at these types of things and really trying to, to get an understanding that this is not just an issue about the land. This is violence on the land, violence on our bodies is a really, really important thing um, that we have to, decolonization forces us to connect with the land. And when you connect with the land, when you are impacting violence on the land, you're impacting violence on yourself. So I really wish you all the best and I thank you all for taking the time to come out today and hope to see you on Indigenous Climate Action's next webinar. So thank you, Melina. Thank you, Kanahus. Masicho. Hi, hi. Hi, hi.